You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. So welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405 on this wonderful day in January here, the first year of another decade. And we have today a, a wonderful guy. We have a great conversation with Paul Trapp, and he is the founding uh, owner and CEO of Event Prep Inc. Uh, it's a full service meeting planning and management company that supports 17 franchisees across the U.S. He and and his partner at Event Prep, uh, Stephen Davis, uh, have written a book called Prep Success: The Entrepreneur's Guide to Achieving Your Dreams. Paul is a former military leader who served as chief of recruiting for the Army National Guard and holds over 30 years of experience in contract management, event planning, and organizing conferences, seminars, and meetings. So welcome to the Pilgrim on the 405, Paul. Thanks, Will, for having me. I appreciate it. So uh, tell us a little bit about how, how you and, uh, and Stephen got started with this, this big enterprise. Well, it didn't start as a big enterprise, right? It just starts as a dream, right? A couple guys that are, um, we were soldiers together. We were cops together. Um, best man in each other's wedding, godfather of each other's kids. You know, we, we, we actually carried each other's mother to the grave. We, we, we had deployed together overseas. There was a long history of friendship before there was ever talk of business. But there was dreams always, you know, get together on a Sunday afternoon after church, you're having a barbecue at the house and you're sitting around having a cold beverage and you're talking about, well, what if, and, and if we could only do this, we could only invent something. If we could only do this or that, we kept on looking around us for what that opportunity was. And I, I think we had a couple false starts. We, uh, we started an after school program for kids and, and, uh, it was a 401, uh, 501c3, uh, not for profit. And then we got deployed. We were in the national guard and got deployed and we had to go overseas. We came back a year later and, you know, that was done. And, you know, we had to go on to the next thing. And, but we, when we were kind of getting to that point where I was getting ready to retire from the military, I, I, I looked at Steve one day and I said, you know, I do a lot of events. I was the chief of recruiting and I was managing a sales force of about 4,500 recruiters. And so we're constantly doing, you know, uh, sales training workshops, quarterly reviews, annual uh, events, state events, regional events, uh, awards banquets. It was just constantly working in that logistical field of planning events and executing events. And I just saw a great opportunity there. I was pretty passionate about it. So when I transitioned off active duty, I said to him, I think I want to start an event planning company. <laughs> and, uh, you know, with that he wanted to invent the next Facebook or the next Snapchat or something. And, and I said, you know, I don't have the skill sets to, to do that, but I, I do know how to take care of people and I, and I know how to lead people. And I know, I knew what caring leadership was. And mm-hmm. I said, I can take some of these. We don't have to invent event planning, right? We don't have to invent it, but we can, we can build a better mousetrap. And so we just, you know, we both threw $1,500. And this was back in 2006. We threw $1,500 each into a, into a kitty. We bought a website. Uh, at the time, it was nationalconference.com. And, and uh, we started. And we, we said, we're going to build an event planning company. We started building the infrastructure. And uh, when you're doing that planning on that blank, piece of paper it's an amazing thing it's your, your juices go crazy that you know the head it's unlimited what you can do right so so kind of how we started. you got going then then what uh what was significant when did you get this whole thing s- not started because the dream is the starting but how did you make it real yeah so the dream yeah so the dream was you know i think i think putting our money where the mouth was and you know putting fifteen hundred dollars each in a kitty and you know raise three thousand dollars I think the wives looked at us like we were crazy. Um, like, oh, here's just another harebrained scheme, you know, that these guys are going to do, and here's a waste of money. And and uh, we literally uh, bought the website. We started planning and thinking about it. We we had some experience with the government because we, you know, I'm a retired army guy. And so I said, let me let me see if we can go after a government contract. And so we went after. We our first government contract was an eighty thousand dollar deal with the Defense Language uh, Organization, Defense Language Institute out in uh, Monterey, California. And it was 2007, we planned our first event, we executed our first event, and uh, it went well. We were very passionate about what we were doing, and of course, your passion very early on overrides all the pain, right? All the mistakes you're going to make, all the, the extra work you're going to do because you didn't plan it right the first time, and, and the, the lessons learned along the way, licking your wounds, but we, you know, the customer at the end of the day was extremely happy. We had a great event, 
Um, and we went back and we high-fived each other and we thought $80,000, we just hit the lottery. This was amazing, you know. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, like, well, t- you, know, you, you got a, a good margin on it, right? Oh, well, there's, there's. Um, I, I think in the early years, there's not a whole lot of margin, right? You don't have a lot of overhead. Well, but you, uh, got, but you, you also, got a multiple of your $3,000 back. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> That's got what counts. Yeah. The funny part was, is as we started to go, you know, Will, we, we, we went from one event to two events to three events and all this during the infancy time frame, where we're all learning and figuring it out. And Steve, Steve and I originally, we sat down in a room and we said, what is this thing supposed to look like? We built an organizational chart of what we want it to be. And there was a bunch of empty seats in there, right? We thought, hey, we're going to have to have an HR person, an IT person. And then we said, okay, it's just the two of us. What jobs are you going to do? Right. And what jobs am I going to do until we can backfill ourselves in each one of these positions that we need? Mm-hmm. And then we split up the work. I'm like, okay, I'll take these jobs and you take these jobs. And, and we literally took responsibility for those jobs. But as we started to grow, for us, there was a turning point out of that infancy going into adolescence where we, um, we did, you know, we had a double weekend where we had to do two events on the same weekend. And Steve went one way and I went another way. <laughs> And we came back and we told stories about how great our events were. Like my event was better than your event. No, my <laughs> event was better than your event. You know? And uh, and we 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 learned from there. But we we actually very short time after that we got a trifecta weekend. We had to do three things at once, and we couldn't do it. And we had to actually bring in an outside person. And and our first employee that we brought in um, is still with us today, actually. Yeah, nice. Um, nice. Yeah, amazing, right? And and uh, they were able to replicate what we were doing. But the, the funny part was we were telling our customers, Hey, you can't have Steve and Paul. You're going to have to have this person, Kelly, come in and do this. Right. And they're like, no, we don't want Kelly. We want Steve and Paul. We love Steve and Paul. And, you know, and which we had to pick a customer and say, sorry, you're stuck with Kelly. And the irony was they weren't stuck with Kelly. Right. <laughs> uh, Kelly was actually a credentialed meeting profession professional from the industry, had a hospitality degree. I've been doing it years. She was much more polished than we were. Yes. So she knocked it out of the park. And after the weekend that, you know, she went and delivered for them. They, they called us and said, yo, we never want to see you guys again. <laughs> Kelly's, our, Kelly's our girl, right? You know? Right. Um, so it really was a growing, you know, thing where we, we took it. We really bootstrapped it incrementally. We started with a minimal investment. We started to grow. We took every dollar we made. We reinvested it back into the company. You know, we, we were, you know, trying to grow, right? We were trying to right. do the thing. Mm-hmm. But what happened is as you as you're starting to get that that transition from infancy to adolescence, there's a big trust thing that happens there. It's you have to trust someone with your baby. Yes. And and you know, it doesn't always work as smoothly as it did with Kelly. Mm-hmm. Right? As you start to grow and, and I can I can fast forward for you, Will, and tell you that this week alone I have eighty four events going on globally. I have events going on in uh, Japan, uh, Korea, Germany all over the United States simultaneously. So we're not just a little, you know, we've grown from a very small organization to a very large global organization. Um, and, but when you, when you're going through those adolescence years, kind of like a teenager, right? When you have a baby, you have to be with it 24 seven and you have to kind of take care of it, wipe its diapers, do everything. And you mm-hmm. you're constantly there, it can't be left alone. And then when you get to a teenager, you're like, okay, well maybe I can go out for the night and leave the kids alone and everything will be okay. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, sometimes you come home and everything's fine. And sometimes, you know, they had a party while you were gone and ruined the house, you know, or trashed the house. Or, mm-hmm. So um, you have to be careful when you're in those phases, but you've got to trust your people, right? So we're able to kind of delegate, uh, let those people run with those missions, give them the guidance, give them the resources. I think that came from our military training, uh, mm-hmm. both of us mm-hmm. being, you know, veterans. Um, and every once in a while, we get a call from a customer that said, hey, what's going on? You know, we've been talking for six months. It's going to go A, B, C, D. And we got on the ground and this guy went A, B, X, Y, Z. Like he changed it up on us. And how come? And what's going, you know, and then you talk to him like, oh, we made an audible. I was on the ground. I decided to go left instead of right. And you're like, eh, that's not what the customer wanted. You know, they wanted you to go right, you know. But anyways, uh, we learned. We, we, you know, we grew. Um, we we got our battle scars early on and uh, we, we have this chapter in our book uh, called befriending Murphy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've heard the Murphy's law, you know, if something will go wrong, it, you know, or can go wrong. It will. Uh, we learned very early on that every event that you can ever plan, do or execute um, will have Murphy involved in it. He's got a backstage pass to every event we've ever done. <laughs> right. Um, right. The difference is over years, you get to recognize what Murphy looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, and you plan for Murphy and you, and you know, 
you know, planning the, the preparation uh, for success is not. Well, that, the, that's a big military thing, isn't it? Contingency right. planning. Well, yeah, absolutely. We've learned, uh, uh, you know, you see it on TV when, you know, it's all sexy when there's a secret agent or a bodyguard taking care of a print, you know, the president and they, you know, but what you don't see is what's behind the scene, right? You know, right. Steve, Steve is a, a, a CID officer. He's, a, he's still in. Steve's actually still in as an army reservist. And he's a bodyguard for VIPs and for, you know, senior level, uh, gen, gen, the secretary of defense and, and, uh, and when he, when he goes and travel, half of it's not when he's escorting the guy as a bodyguard. Half of it's when he's there a week before the guy gets there and he's talking, he's going to figure out where the hospital's at and what the routes they're taking right. are at. And right. Where's the exit, right. and the eager, you know, egress. And, and uh, so it's a lot of planning. And, and I'll tell you, everything in life we do, Will, is planned. Mm -hmm. we, take it, we take it for such granted. What you're going to eat for dinner tonight is going to be a direct result of what you planned before you left your house. What did you pull out of the freezer? What did you, what are you thawing out? What, where are you going to dinner, meeting who for what dinner at a restaurant? Or, and, you know, it's either a direct result of what you plan or a direct result of the failure to plan. Well, what are well, you going to eat tonight, right? And, and, um, and I, I would so, suggest that it's, it's also a result of what everybody else planned in the ecosystem. Because you're not going to pull yeah. anything out of the refrigerator that didn't get planned for a long time ago in the Oh, absolutely. When you purchase the meal it. and the, the ingredients, the other ingredients to make the meal. And, well, and you who's know, growing it and, and how it's getting there. All of those things. We prepare for dates. Our first date, getting ready for our first date. You remember that? You know, right. and you, we prepare for job interviews. We prepare to go to work. We prepare to go on vacation. We prepare... You know, and it starts very early in life. As a young boy, I was a, you know, a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout. And Boy Scouts, what was, you know, was be prepared, right? right? It was, right. that was the motto, right? They taught us mm -hmm. how to be prepared. And then you, uh, we, uh, law enforcement, you don't, you don't just show up with a gun one day in a badge and say, you know, I'm your worst nightmare. I'm a cop. You know, you go through training. You prepare yourself. You, you, it becomes muscle reflex on how you respond to things. National Guard, I give reference to, I was a commander in the National Guard. You know, we got, we got the alert to go overseas and deploy. Well, it wasn't the first time we practiced uh, going to war. You know, you, you literally, you have mobilization books on the shelf, right? Uh, the plan has already been planned and executed and practiced 100 times before you actually go, right? So when the, when the balloon goes up and they give you the call and say, hey, report to the Armory, we're going to war. You pull the book off the shelf, you open it up, and you're going like, all right, Lieutenant Jones, you're the supply officer. Go get the beans and the bullets. Lieutenant Smith, you're the maintenance officer. Go get the vehicles ready for convoy. You know, da, 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 da. There's already a checklist of everything that's already been planned. Hurricane, I live in Florida, hurricane preparedness. To get, you know, get, your, get your kit ready in case we have to evacuate. You know, uh, we prepare, unfortunately, now we prepare for you know, active shooter situations in schools and churches, right? We prepare all the time and everything we do. And there's an old saying, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall and practice, practice, practice? You know, that's all, all the old joke, right? But the Super Bowl, right? Unfortunately, my New England Patriots aren't going to go to the Super Bowl this year, but they've got a long, rich history of going in the past, right? right. And, right. and during this time, they don't just, Tom Brady and Belichick and the team, and they don't just show up on, the, on, the, on, the, on game day and say, all right, let's get a ball and throw a couple guys together and try to win this thing, right? It's what they do on the practice field. The Super Bowl isn't one on game day. It's one on the practice field. They just collect a trophy on game day. Well, what, what I have found in, in working with uh, the entrepreneurial operating system, working with companies, is that many leaders do not know how to accomplish goals. Right? It's not just wishing or hoping or dreaming. There yeah. is, there are ways of accomplishing goals that regard with, with regard to time and resources and money and people. And, and so learning how to do that is practicing. And that's what we literally do for a couple of years is we practice. We'll set goals for 90 days for a quarter, and then we'll come back and say, how did it work? We're looking for 80%, a hundred percent done. And uh, it doesn't all start off that way. So people are actually learning how to set clear goals, how to make them specific and measurable and achievable, and how to stay focused on them over that 90-day period. Because 
achieving something, you can talk about the plans that people that have already been prepared for them. But as an entrepreneur, you're sitting there with a brand new market every day. And so learning how to address those and, and a, achieve your goals, that's a, that's a skill. And I think that's, that takes practice. Well, I will give a lot of credit to the military uh, for my early, my, my parents, of course, trained me well as a child, but right. the, the, the Boy Scouts trained me well, the National Guard. I have a lot of people I can go back and thank in my life, but mm -hmm. truly, um, you know, I, I learned a couple of little cliche sayings in the military. They were like, things that get measured, get done. Yes. You know, inspect what you expect. Uh, no, very, very easy to remember cliches, but you know, when you're, when you're trying to grow an organization and you have to trust other people to, to run those footballs and those touchdowns for you, right, on game day, mm -hmm. um, there's practice, there's planning. Uh, you still got to be prepared for the what ifs, the contingency planning, as you said, right? What happens if this happens? And, you know, nothing, I can tell you, nothing like uh, showing up. We did a, we did a, we've been using the same uh, telecom communications company since the day we started our business, right? So, been with them 15 years, got a great track record with them. We're an Inc. 500, second fastest growing company in America, doing 50 million you know, a year. We're not hurting for revenues. We're not, you know, everything's going the way we want it to go. I send a team out to go do an event once with a customer. We're in St. Louis. They're on the ground. They're doing the early morning drills, checking all the AV, making sure everything's ready. They go the night before, everything's working fine. They need live Wi-Fi to, you know, put the presentation up on the thing. And they go to turn the hotspot on and it doesn't work. And they're like, it was working last night. This is an hour before showtime. So we're checking why. And they're doing backup. We have redundancy things. We're going, nothing's working. And we're trying to go like, why? Oh, my God. This is like showtime. It's critical. It's, it's failure. You know, it's, and I, we find out that our uh, credit card that was on file to do auto pay had right. expired. The one on file we used to know right. the accounting side, you know. So they literally turned off the hotspots that we were using the day of the game, like the morning of the showdown. Right. So we right. had contingency plans. We had other people come in that, you know, they had hotspots on their personal phones and we were able to overcome and adapt and achieve. And, but, you know, no matter how much you plan, no matter how good you are, you, I think you always have to be ready for the what if, and, and you have to be, you know, and I, I can't say it's me, it's the team. I got 65 employees at my corporate headquarters that are, 40 of them are CMP, certified meeting professionals that just, they have a keen eye for knowing, they know it before it comes. They can see it coming mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and they, they're, they're agile enough to be able to kind of navigate it. And, and we give them the resources, we give them the authority and the empowerment to be able to solve problems. And that's right. the key. And, and, and what, what we talk about is you have to have the right people in the right seats. And right yeah. people means that they agree with your values. They agree with where you're going. They, they understand what's going on here. And, and they want to live the kind of life that the organization wants to live. So you have common values that you share. That's right no. people. And then right seat means that they get it. They, they understand what this is all about. And they understand how what they do helps the company achieve its goals. They, they want to do it. They're bouncing out of bed to do it. And finally, they have the capacity. And that's, that's what I hear you saying is, I'll bet you, you hire, always hire people who are better than you. You know, it's, it, it's funny. Well, I have, a, um, I have a very rich history in recruiting. I went from a military recruiter on the streets, helping people, high school kids achieve their dreams, figure out what they want to be when they grow up and try to line them up with the right career path. And, mm -hmm. and I went into state leadership and then I went to, you know, the federal leadership. I was, I was chief of recruiting from the National Guard when I retired. And, um, I spent most of my adult life recruiting the right people, right? I'm looking for the right people. But I'll tell you, for me, recruiting is not a, uh, it's not an event. Unfortunately, I think most companies in America today, they're like, Oh, Bill gave us notice. We better get the job description out on the street and react to that. Right. And get a backfill for Bill, you know? Uh, and um, sorry to see you go, Bill, but you know, here's your new guy, Tony, he's going to be your backfill and, you know, spend a couple days with him and, you know, it's a very reactive thing. And for me, recruiting is not an event. It's a process. Um, I think if you're waiting until, you know, if, <laughs> I had a, uh, I was trying to grow the organization. We we're trying to add more salespeople, director of sales, vice president of sales. We're trying to, you know, go from a one guy show me to being the sales guy mm -hmm. to a team of salespeople. And, and as we're growing into that, I, I picked a guy out several years ago and his name's Phil. He's my vice president of sales. 
he was working for a hotel chain and he was a director of sales for a large hotel chain. And I, and I, I started courting him early on, like almost like we were dating, right? Like, I mean, I'm taking him out to dinners. I'm, I, you know, get him tickets to a ball game or, you know, we're asking how this is going. I was that I, I'm building a relationship with this person mm -hmm. and all along. I'm thinking, I want this guy to come work for me. I couldn't afford him at the beginning when I started taking him out to dinner. Right. But I knew this was the guy. And so now he's, he's been with me a couple of years, my vice president of sales. It took a while to do that, but it wasn't a reactionary thing to someone leaving or a, Hey, great idea. Let's go find someone. I think it's better to, Take your time and find the person that you want, like you said, to find what the right, you know, ethics are, the right, the same beliefs, the values, uh, you know, have the people that understand what it is you're trying to do so they can go in the right direction. Um, I shared with you before we went on the air and, and I will share with you today. Now, again, that, you know, every person that joins our organization and we're a growing organization still to this day, we have seven new people starting out this Thursday. Uh, it's on the agenda. First hour spent with the owners of the company. Right. We'll come in, we'll sit them down, we'll turn off our phones, we'll turn off our computers. And the, we tell them, don't take any notes, don't be nervous. We're the owners of the company. The most important thing going on in this building right now is you. It's your first day with us, right? right. right. You have to understand what you're getting involved in. I, I'm glad you made it through HR. I'm glad you made it through the vetting process. I know you were the best pick because our people pick good people. But we, you know, we, we're not Google and we're not Zappos. We don't have like a golf putt putt golf thing on our roof and we don't, you know, have a swimming pool in our, in our break room or, you know, but we, we, we've got a great culture and the culture of the organization starts with us, right? And it starts with how we set it from the day they come into our organization. We celebrate them coming. When they walk in that front door, this is kind of crazy. When they walk in that front door, there's a sign there that greets them. It's a little electrical sign that says, welcome, you know, to your first day. There's balloons tied to a little welcome sign thing. You know, they literally, we're celebrating this new employee, right? At the same time we're celebrating them at work, I'm sending to their house candy or a bottle of wine or something to the spouse going, welcome to the family, right? It's a small investment, but it's making such an impact on them on their first day. Most people, I mean, if Think, listen to your listeners. You know, I, I promise you, their first day at work was something along the lines of, I showed up, the HR director was too busy, it was a Monday morning, they put me in a room, they sat me down, gave me a company manual, I started reading that for four hours. Uh, and they said, let me get my business cards ready, and, and my computer's coming in a couple of weeks, and all of that stuff. Why isn't it all ready immediately when the guy walks in the door? Uh, lack of planning. Yes. Lack, lack of preparation, right? It's so easy to do it the right way on the front end. And then, you know, when we talked a little bit about culture, it starts there on day one, right? But I can share with you, I just, I'd love to just take a moment and share one of the things that we do here internally that I felt was, um, you know, culture is either by default or by design. Mm -hmm. You know, the leaders of an organization just show up every day for a paycheck and they, it is what it is and everyone gets along and some people don't, whatever, it is what it is. Or you, the leaders of the organization can actually get together and go like, okay, we're thinking about doing this. How does this affect the employees? How does, how does this affect the customers? How long is it going to take? What's it going to do? What are the impacts? What are the collateral effects? And when you just take a few minutes to talk about it without you know, over analysis and beating the thing, we had a great, the first time we ever really were successful, I think it was back in 2012, we went from like, wow, we were on the, we were number 23 on the Inc. 500. We had done you know, 7,000% growth or something. It was crazy. We, we actually had leftover money at the end of the year. We, were, we felt socially responsible to give money away. We wanted to, you know, and I remember we had about 50 grand uh, that we, we decided we were going to give away. Um, and it would have been very easy for Steve and I, the owners of the company to sit in a closed office and go, well, you know, Hey brother, what's important to you? Hey, your sister died of cancer. Why don't we give money to the cancer organization? And you know, we make the announcement at the company meeting and everyone goes, oh, golf clap, pass the bagel, you know, no impact whatsoever. We got a tax donation relief and it's, we did something good. We sleep better at night. But we had that $50,000 and, and I said to Steve in the room, I said, Steve, how do we involve our employees? And he's like, oh, that's going to be a cluster, man. Dude, if you let them give the money away, you're going to have 50 different opinions of which, where the money goes and they're going to start infighting and da, da, da. I'm like, okay, well, time out. We have 50 employees. We have $50,000. Is the math adding up for you? Why don't we, why don't we take $1,000 each and give it to each one of the employees and tell them that they have to gift it to a 501c3 of their choice 
Right. But all you have to do to do that is to fill out a one page little checklist, what, name the organization and give us a sense of why right. them. Right. Right. And it wasn't passed or failed. We weren't going to deny it as long as they were recognized as a 501c3. And all of a sudden we, we announced the program, hey, we're each going to give away a thousand dollars. And you had, you know, we have some higher end, highly compensated employees. But you also got people that are answering the phones for 10, 12 bucks an hour, that, you know, working in the call center or something. And now you're taking a young kid out of college making you know, 30,000 a year, 35,000 a year, they're not thinking about giving away a thousand dollars. They've right. never thought about that yet. They, have, they haven't got to that stage in life where they're thinking, but now all of a sudden they have to give away a thousand dollars and they, they're like, well, it's a big responsibility. I better find something that I believe right. in. What do I believe? In? Like, I don't even know what I believe in. Right. They have to do this personal inventory. Right. And all of a sudden they start talking to, well, what are you going to give your money to? Right. Well, I'm going to give it to the dog, you know, shelter. I'm going to give it to the kids after school program. I'm going to give it to the, Red Cross or the, the Shriners Burn Hospital. And, and then the stories come up. Why the Shriners Burn Hospital? Well, my brother was burnt very badly as a child and they saved his life. And I always wanted to give back. And so all of a sudden now you got people coming to you going, hey, boss, three of us discovered we like the same thing. Can we, can we pull our money together and give one check for $3,000? And yeah. so we had this, we're event planners. So we had this big breakfast. We invited all the recipients in. We had the big Happy Gilmore checks. We we invited, you know, the community to come to this celebration where we were given our, you know, we were, we were sharing our success with the local community individually. Mm -hmm. We incorporated some people. And then the side effects we never even thought about was the person that gave the thousand dollars to the dog shelter met the person that worked at the dog shelter. And they were like, Oh, you should come see it one day, come down and see the operation. And then the next thing you know, they're volunteering on Saturdays at the dog shelter, <laughs> right. out to the community and it had such effect and impact. It could have been just write a check and get a receipt or let's create something that involves our, our employees. And when you do it that way, it just, it may, it, 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 that impacts the culture that designs the culture. Well, it also educates the people, helps them to learn how to do that and make that part of their life rather than waiting until they're 40 or 45 and have some excess money and wonder what, income, right? Right? You're, you're, you're from the very beginning, you're prepping it. You're, you know, uh, uh, but pouring in that water that you got pouring into the pump to prime it, right? You're yeah. helping them. And in helping them, you're helping the whole culture. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, we've been, we've been blessed to be able to do that. And we've done a year, you know, years on end. And um, it's just a great, great activity just to include them that, the inclusiveness of that. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with you one, one additional thing. Well, you said, uh, you know, finding the right people on the right, you know, seat in the bus and get people that have the same values that align with yours. And, uh, uh, as a recruiter, when I recruit these people, I'm looking for a certain thing. And I'll tell you, there's, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I think by heart. I think I was ever since I've been a little kid. I remember the right. first, I remember the first bite of the apple when I was a little kid and then right. how I, it made me feel and, and, uh, and how I try to replace that. It's almost like a drug, right? Trying to go out and get that high again every right. day. And, and uh, um, I found that I'm not necessarily looking for employees when I go to look for employees. No, no. I'm, I'm not looking for entrepreneurs either because I don't want someone that's no. going to, you know. No. But there's a, there's a middle ground there, and I call them intrapreneurs. Uh -huh. that, that person that's an employee, but they're, they're an entrepreneur, but they're inside of your organization. And I'll tell you when, you, when you give them ownership of what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, that culture that you try to put out, it's not your culture. They own the culture. Mm -hmm. They begin, they take ownership of the culture. They right. start doing the things they start, you give them the, the uh, resources to solve problems and you give them the, the, the decision-making ability, the authority to do things. Mm -hmm. They'll shine like you never would have thought. And, and all of our successes, I can, I can, I can tell you, Hey, we wrote a book. We did this. We did every, just about every story in this book is about one of my employees, right? It's about, it's about the lessons we learned together and what I learned from them and, and how we grew as an organization, but it's because of them that we are actually successful. It's Steve and I just had a vision. Right. And, and <clears throat> what, what I have found is that, is that lots of people spend a lot of time doing things that they are uh, very good at, but don't want to do. And what I hear from you is that you are helping people to find out what they're good at and want to do and capitalizing on that because that's where productivity and joy comes in because all of Absolutely. a sudden I'm not doing what somebody else told me I had to do or what they wanted me to do just because I'm good at it. 
they're asking me not only what am I good at doing, but what do I want to do? And when you have that, ultimately, you're going to get to a place where you have people who love to do it and are great at it. And and that, to me, that that's not entrepreneurial. That's human. And that's helping people to really become the best that they can possibly be. Well, you nailed it. And, and I'm, uh, you know, there's a lot of little plugs about the book or different things. There's something in the book that we never even spoke about that's uh, a mentor I had, Major General Ronald O. Harrison, uh, was the adjutant general out of uh, Florida. He told me when I was in recruiting very early on, he said to me, he said, Paul, go find young people of promise and enable them to become. That's the quote. I, I remember yeah. it ingrained in my head. Go find young people of promise and enable yeah. them to become. It's in it's it's in the book. I write. I, I thank him in the book for his mentorship and, and right. talk about his guidance right. to me. I remember I remember as a recruiter taking a young man in a high school and saying, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And he said, "I want to be a lawyer." And I said, "Okay, what kind of law do you want to practice?" And he goes, "Like, I don't know, like 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 on TV with you know fast cars and right, pretty right, girls right. and you know right. high drama in the courtroom, right?" And I'm like, "Right, right. you know, no, it's family law, civil law, criminal law, environmental law, tax law, international. Like, you know, we can go on forever." Right. Have you ever been inside of a courtroom? He's like, no. I said, how do you know you want to be a lawyer if you've never been inside of a courtroom? Right. Well, I, you know, I'm looking at schools. Of course, I've got my, my undergraduate first, and I'll go down. To, I would pick my law school up. Like, <laughs> that's good when you're a junior or senior in high school, right? But so I, back in the day, I think it's, I don't know if you can still do this or not, but I, I was a kind of an entrepreneur or recruiter. I'm like, okay, well, you need to go to a courtroom. I literally right. talked to the school, talked to the parents. Right. Got a field trip thing signed. I took the kid out of school, brought him to a courtroom. I was a police officer at the time, a reserve police officer. I went in uniform as a police officer. Um, show, I'm literally in the in the courtroom sitting next to this kid. We're in like traffic court, you know, misdemeanor court, watching the people go up to the podium and get sentenced. And next, it's like a turn style thing, you know. Right. And I'm telling, I'm whispering in the kid's ear and telling them this right. is happening, that's happening. And, and the 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 the, uh, the judge time out right in the middle of the morning goes, officer, you have business with the court today. I see you're back in the thing. I said, uh, and I've been there for two hours. You know, I said, uh, no, sir. I got a young man here. I'm a military recruiter with the National Guard, and he wants to be a lawyer. And I told him I bring him to a courtroom. But that changed that kid's life. Yeah, it, it made a difference. Yeah, because yes. the judge called him up to the yeah. podium. Let me let me ask you questions. We went to lunch with the judge. Uh, you know, yeah. you would, we we took a kid yeah. with yeah. promise and enabled them to become right. Right. Well, and it's it's different. Yeah. I mean, it's listening to what they want. And when you talk about a child of promise, I mean, to me, it's it the promise is not out there in them. Uh, it it's we turn it on by by inquiring. Uh, respectfully creating the environment for them to say, this is what I want. And and when they say, this is what I want, I mean, as an, as an, uh, you know, an employer, what they want may mean that they're going to leave the organization, go someplace else, but it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And and that to me is when things really begin to happen in an organization is when you have a hundred percent, literally a hundred percent, right people in the right seat that's when things really become magic your your employee retention is off the roof (laughs) your customers are happy and you know there's an old saying if you get it right with your you get it right with your uh your employees they'll get it right with the customers right that's That's kind of the 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 business buzz like get it right with the employees but it's there's nothing truer right if you just take care of your employees um if you take care of them in the time of need if you if you celebrate them if you reward them um, if you include them, you give them a safe place to work, you allow them to, to grow. And you, well, and, and you ask them, regularly ask them, what do you want? Where do you want to go? How do you see yourself? How can I help you to get there? And then how can I help you get there? And th- holding them accountable for what they said they wanted to do. I- I'll share with you, this is the book that, that we use that uh, Gina Wickman wrote called Traction. I'm going to send you a copy of it because you're living it out. I'd right? love to. Yeah, I'd love to read it. And, and uh, uh, then I want to talk with you about it and, and, and have a conversation about it. But, but helping, helping the whole organization to become better than what they are. One of my, one of my clients, uh, a manufacturing company, um, you know, they have 40 people on the line turning bolts, moving machines around, uh, taking care of creating these pumps. And, 
and, and what they realized was that a lot of these people had never learned about stewardship of finances. They didn't know how to deal with money. And so they found somebody who could come in and speak their language at their level and help them learn how to budget, learn how to, how to financial set. literacy. Oh my goodness. And, and, and it, it, Talk about retention. I mean, who wants to leave a company that's going out of their way to help them be better with their families, better producers, and and uh, and and learn how to how to how to steward their financial resources? It's just amazing when people begin to turn from "I'm the one at the top," it's "I'm isolated," and "I'm the one who has to make this all happen." To we're a team here. And we agree on what our goals are. I can tell you what I want, but after that, let's begin to share and put together the plan for how we're going to get there. Unfortunately, Will, there's too many employers out there that are saying, I'm the boss, you're the employee, you do what I say, I give you a paycheck. And those people are just exchanging their hours for their dollars. Yes. Uh, right. You know, there, there's no job satisfaction. It's a, they're living paycheck to paycheck. It's a grind. I'm, I'm telling you, if you have a dream, um, you know, I'm not trying to get Gary Vanderchuk, you know, that uh, he's out there telling everyone, you know, get, quit your job, get a side hustle, sell, you know, flip, you know, flip uh, eBay items or it's all good. But but yeah. find your passion. Right. Yes. And and uh, even in the most challenging times in the most challenging economies, if you follow your passion, if in if you're a leader, if you're allowing people to grow. And, 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 you know, you realize that your responsibility is not only to, you know, the bottom line and getting the job done, right, but to grow your team. I, you know, sales manager is not responsible for, you know, uh, increasing sales. No. A sales manager is responsible for, you know, uh, developing and growing a sales force. And helping those people. Different skill sets. Helping those people be the best that they can be, helping them get what they want, which is generally not money. Correct. Right? So yeah. many CEOs think, well, all I have to do is give them more money. Uh, that's not it. No. That is not it. There are other things that people want that money becomes a, a, a lubrication for it. It becomes a way to get what I want. But if I can't see that doing this job is helping me get what I want, you're not going to get high productivity. And I may not stay around very long. You're short-lived. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm excited about is – is with, you know, because of this book Traction, Gina Wickman put together this system called EOS, and now there are 350, soon to be 700 of us around the country, literally around the world. And, and our goal, what Gino's goal was by 2020, having EOS implemented in 10,000 companies. And we wow. will hit that goal this year. And our new goal, which we have adopted now that Gino has, has turned over the company to a different, you know, to the succeeding leadership is, is by 2030, there are going to be 100,000 companies running on it. We're going to change the way that businesses run in this world. That's, imp that's impactful. I mean, that's making a difference, right? Yes. Because so, so many lives are impacted. Oh, it's my not goodness. just the one. It, it, you know, using this system that the whole experience of business becomes a lot more productive, a lot more profitable and a lot more fun because people are actually accomplishing the things that they want to do. And they have the tools and the expertise and the experience about succeeding because they've learned how, and that's what it's about. And it sounds to me like that's what you guys are doing in your company. Well, you know, we, we didn't have the benefit of your organization training us on it. We, we did have the military. I think we were good learners. And the funny thing is, in the military, half the things I wanted to do, I couldn't do because it was restrictions and limitations. Right, right, right. right. Um, you know, when Salesforce, you couldn't give away sales bonuses to the top recruiters. You know, it was right. right. Uh, so money wasn't driving their train. Right. But they were successful. Um, you know, you find what it is, what makes the organization tick. Right. And you fuel right. that. And um, I tell you, uh, we've been able to grow a, a really healthy organization. Right. Um, and we have a lot of happy customers out there. Our, our retention of our employees, the retention of our customers. Um, and, you know, it's event planning. Right? <laughs> event planning. It's not like we developed some, you know, technology that's changing the world. Or, 
you know, we just built a little better of a mousetrap. But my, my guess is that in the same way that you are finding employees and helping them to get what they want, that that becomes the way that you deal with your customers, that you begin with, tell me what you want, rather than let me tell you what we will do for you. The, the best opening line I ever use with a customer, and it's not a line, it's truly part of my process. I'll sit with the new client across the table from them at a lunch or anywhere, and I'll say, so Bill, how do you define success at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. When the event is over, how we know it's successful? And I can't tell you how many people that are doing many events, multiple events a year, using their organizational resources, trying to figure it out, they're working the way, and they go, you know, I really don't know. Right. I, there's not really a report card at the end of the thing that says we did good. I, I, you know, I guess I just know my boss is happy and tells me it's good. And that's how I know. And there's so many ways to define what success looks like. And if I know what success looks like, you know, the kind of beauty of event planning is um, uh, it's very easy. It's uh, it's the same process mm-hmm. no matter who the client is. Right. It's a right. system right. and a process that's, that's right. successful. Yeah. Right? That's right. I don't care if you're the international chiefs of police or if you're an association of heart surgeons. You, know, you, you want online registration. You want a good hotel. You want graphic design, printing, staffing, food and beverage, audio visual. There's only like 10 things that we do in the, in the box, right? And it's being expertise. You have expertise in every one of those lanes and knowing how to deliver it and when to deliver it and right. what could possibly go wrong with it. But, when people come together for meetings, they're coming together for one reason. They're not coming together for the great break food, uh, you know, or the, you know, the, the, the audio visual show that they're going to see. They're coming together to speak about something that's very important to that organization. Those chiefs of police need to get together and talk about law enforcement stuff and important things that are going on out there in the world today. They don't need to be worrying that the breakout room in number three has a burnt out bulb in the projector and that the coffee was 20 minutes late coming out for break and people were bottlenecked at the, and the registration system wasn't working. And right. you know, those are the things that when we do the process, when we take care of the, 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 the complex detail oriented process, it frees them up to, to focus on the content, which is the right. most important thing right. to the customer. Right. Right. Yep. That, well, that, you know, that's the same thing is true with EOS as the, you know, an entrepreneurial operating system. People ask, well, what niches work with EOS? And, and it's any organization that has the freedom. And that means we generally don't work uh, with, with a, a public company because they're yeah. not agile enough. But with, right. with a private company, uh, uh, companies. and one of the first things we ask them is, what, you know, where do you want to be? What are you trying to accomplish here? What's the most important thing? And then what's getting in the way? You know, what are the quality of your meetings? What's the quality of accountability? Uh, you know, is the, is the, you know, if we ask, you know, how, how, uh, how aligned is the entire organization around the plan? And very often what we hear is what plan? What plan? <laughs> where's, the play, where's the playbook? That's right. What, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And, and that's what we help them achieve is all of those things and so it's been really fun talking with you uh, uh paul because this is exciting to see to see business in america and eventually around the world change from that top down we know best to in in involving the entire organization uh through a structured plan a structured uh, relationships how we have greater accountability how we have greater joy in what we're doing and how do we increase the profit so that we can do the kind of things you did with sharing with the rest of the community. You know, what's, what's great, Will, is you said just a few minutes ago about, you know, it, the employees and the relationships with the employees really probably, you know, spins off into the relationships we have with our customers. And, and I guess at the end of the day, it's kind of cliche to say this, but wouldn't it be great to be the same person all the time? <laughs> you know, why do I have to be different with my customers that I have to be with my employees that I have to be different with, you know, if I'm just the same guy and, it, and it's not rocket science, you, there is no manual to learn how to, you know, like, Hey, here's the steps you take to build a good cu- culture. If you just <laughs> care about your people. Right? right. And you, and you, and everything that you do, I, I start off at the beginning going like every decision we make, we say, how does this affect our employees? That's, that's right. part of our, part of our operating. How does this affect? What is the, you know, are, do we want to do that? What is the cost associated with that? You know, there's, there's a process, a decision-making process. 
but at the end of the day, it's their company. Right. We're, we're blessed to be at the head of it. That's I get right. To go, I get to go collect the trophies and, you know, and then come back. And, and what a switch that is. What a switch that is to realize that the leadership team really does become that ownership of the company and helps make those decisions to move forward. And ultimately, the entire organization owns the company because they own the culture. We do. When I was in the military, if I made a mistake, I thank God I never made that bad of a mistake where they removed me, right? But I've seen it where if someone made a really bad mistake, they just pull someone out and they put someone else in and the organization still continued to hope. They just brought in new leadership, right? right? I think what I learned when I stepped out on my own as an entrepreneur is that they weren't going to replace me with someone. I was it. <laughs> there was no they. I was they. Yeah. <laughs> right? So so if I had to get it right, it was I had 50, 60 people that their mortgages getting paid at the end of the month depended on whether I made good decisions or bad decisions. That's right. So there's a different level of responsibility. Right. Uh, but right. I, I think it's a thriving right. thing. I think, right. I think entrepreneurs thrive on that. Well, well, Paul, what would you what would you like for people to do who are hearing this? Uh, would I mean, are you looking for new customers? Uh, are you looking for new employees? So. All, all of the above, right? Anytime that we can grow as a brand, we're constantly, like I said, recruiting is not an event. When you can go to the website, you can see, you know, positions that are open or vacant, but I'm constantly trying to align myself with pe like-minded people, people that want to grow, people that want to glow, you know, that really want to kind of um, transition, transform. I spend a lot of my downtime working with veterans that are transitioning off active duty that want to start their own business entrepreneurs, you know, I try to mentor and coach with them through different organizations I'm involved in. Um, but, you know, always looking to take on good clients. So if you're, you know, if you're someone that uh, has a meeting, I don't care if it's as small as a family reunion with a dozen people, or if you want to put together a corporate event with thousands of people, we're coming out to LA uh, in 2020 with a group, one of our customers bringing 20,000 people to LA. It's a big event. Um, so we can do it everything from that small boardroom with 12 people to 20,000 people. Um, so we'd love to take good care of customers. We always look for talented people. Good. And I'll just tell you, if you are, if you are uh, an entrepreneur trapped in an employee's body and you're trying to figure out how to make that transition, visit us, www.davistrap.com. That's Steve and I's personal brand. We love to help people transition. We love to help work with the organization and, and transform you as an individual, the organization. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, all, all of the above, Event Prep and uh, Davis Trap are the two uh, places to go. Dot com. Excellent. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us. This yeah, is, thank this you, is, Will. Really appreciate the opportunity. Well, it's a wonderful example of, of how uh, businesses thrive. We focus on businesses in California, and I'm glad to hear that you're coming out to California. Maybe we get together for some coffee. Absolutely. Look forward to it. So, Tremendous. Glad to be with you. And this is just one more example of how businesses in California can thrive. You've been listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. 